Digital. Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Tamer. Today, William will be discussing the 2023 trends in enterprise analytics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via your favorite social media platform using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Anthony from Tamer for a brief word from our sponsor. Anthony, hello and welcome. You're muted. Are you there, Anthony? Can you all hear me? Hey, Anthony, are you there? There we go. <laughs> oh, he just muted again. It looks like we're, yep, okay. Looks like everyone can hear me. Are you there? Anthony? Hello? Should I go first? Um, uh, well, we can get Anthony on the line. Um, Anthony, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Did you put your, I think I want to make sure you're, we tested everything before he. How about now? Can you hear me? There we go. There we are. <laughs> Woot. Result. <laughs> all right. That was on me. <laughs> you're all good. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, you just muted again, Anthony. Yes. Yep. Thank you. All right. Hello and welcome. And when you're ready to share your slides. Awesome. Uh, I will. I will do that. Sorry about the uh, audio problems there. So uh, I assume I missed a, a brilliant uh, introduction. Okay. So um, uh, welcome, and uh, I thought I would uh, take a moment and. Uh, share. Uh, we've recently, Tamer's recently published a, um, a document called 23 Trends for 2023 in Enterprise Analytics. Um, and of course, what I wanted to do was spend uh, you know, 45 minutes going over each of the 23 different mm -hmm. trends, but that's probably not possible. Um, so I thought I would share just, just a little bit. Um, and to start, just quick uh, introduction. I'm the Chief Product Officer uh, here at Tamer, of a long um, history in the enterprise software business, started working at a, a place called Siebel Systems, worked for many years at, at Click in the analytics, user-driven analytics space, more recently at Salonis, and then I joined uh, Tamer. I, I mentioned that partly because uh, what excited me about uh, Tamer is also what I think is a really interesting challenge in the analytics space. So having spent many years at Click, uh, and at Salonis, I have a lot of experience on the front end of the analytics challenge on how we create dashboards and analysis and reports for people to make meaning out of data. My experience, however, uh, was that in many cases, having done all that wonderful work creating a dashboard, for example, the users didn't trust or believe the data behind that dashboard. Um, and so at its most, uh, you know, at its most basic, what Tamer set up to do uh, is to help improve the quality of enterprise data. Uh, and we do that uh, having um, 
built on foundational technology developed at uh, MIT that uh, developed a set of machine learning algorithms for matching data across silo data sets and improving the quality of that underlying data. Um, so the opportunity to spend some time thinking about how we actually get better data in the hands of people was, a, was an exciting opportunity. And the reason um, that this is such an important problem is that uh, data has a huge amount of value inside every organization. Probably not something I need to convince anyone on this call about, but you know, when you think about the opportunity that most organizations have as they become uh, more digital uh, and take advantage of the data, uh, built, using data can obviously drive bottom line results in, in terms of revenue. So you can think about things like cross-sell and upsell opportunities. It can, it can deliver uh, results in terms of cost. So, you know, thinking about how we optimize uh, spend, how we drive uh, operational efficiency, the old adage, if it's uh, not measured, it won't, uh, it won't change. Um, and it can help avoid uh, discontinuous uh, uh, adverse effects, uh, reducing risk. So, you know, looking at places where we can uh, improve corporate risk management. At the center of all of these sorts of concepts, uh, all of these opportunities really is clean, curated, continuously up-to-date data. And that's really you know, the, the big opportunity. And I suspect that a lot of the reason that everyone is on this call is thinking about how your organization, how you can think about taking advantage of data to capture these opportunities. And so uh, it's in that spirit uh, that, uh, as I'd indicated at the top of the, the um, uh, top of the call, that uh, Tamer uh, spent some time and published the 23 predictions for uh, calendar uh, 2023. Um, and, you know, there's obviously not enough time to go through uh, all 23, but one of the things we did is we took the opportunity to go and canvas a whole set of professionals outside of, you know, really across the industry and get their perspective on what's changing in the data analytics space. So you know, these are not just predictions from the perspective of Tamer, but really, uh, you know, how we think about the data analytics space uh, changing. Um, they also include uh, what I think is pretty interesting forward uh, by Dr. Michael Stonebreak, who uh, indicated that uh, Tamer started from academic research at MIT. Uh, Mike was the, was the academic that, uh, that started and, and actually did that, that research. Uh, anyway, so I'll, picking on a couple of the trends, and then I'm going to a deep dive on one of them. But, uh, you know, there are a couple of sort of just quick highlights. So, you know, for example, trend number two around the role of the chief data officer. So, um, and I've spent a lot of time over the last year both talking to chief data officers and, and, that, uh, and, and sort of spending time with them. Um, what I think you're starting to see is uh, what we listed as prediction number two, that the focus of chief data officers is going to shift from really technical problems towards uh, business problems, business opportunities, or uh, sort of prediction number nine around marketplaces. So uh, our view is that data marketplaces are extremely valuable and you're gonna see significant growth in them, but the missing component in data marketplaces is match. It's the ability to know what of the data in that marketplace is relevant for your internal data platform. Uh, or number 10, uh, sort of very uh, related to that is, and I think part of the reason marketplaces are gonna be so successful is that many or most companies will recognize that the best version of their data doesn't sit in their ERP or in their data lake or in their system of record, it sits outside their organization. And so if you can take advantage of data that sits outside of your organization, uh, that's really, really valuable. Or number 17, uh, this, uh, Finally, we're going to see organizations move away from source-based governance and towards consumption-based governance. So focusing energy on where data is used as a mechanism of providing governance and oversight versus its uh, source or creation point. Or lastly, prediction number 21, uh, that, that data storage costs will uh, continue to fall uh, precipitously, uh, and the, uh, effectively storing data is, you know, is effectively free. 
So uh, I thought I would drill in on, however, uh, prediction number eight, which is around data product, partly because I just think it's uh, particularly interesting. And so um, from our perspective, uh, uh, 2023 is the year of managing data as a product. And, and this is a sort of an important idea, but um, uh, something I've always said is that every business at its core is fundamentally a data business. And so uh, if every business is a data business, like you might think you're a retailer or you might think you're a hospital or a healthcare provider or a manufacturing company, actually uh, you're in the data business. And the sooner you recognize you're in the data business, the better. And if you recognize you're in the data business, then one of your most important assets is the data you generate. And that produces this opportunity to manage that data as a product and connect it to the business value you generate for your customers. So at a practical level, you know, what does that mean? Like what is a data product? Um, and our view of the data product uh, has a couple of really key uh, components. Uh, first is that it's organized around the logical entities that you use for managing your business. So things like companies or customers, suppliers, products, uh, if you're in the oil and gas, it might be wells, it could be uh, you know, travelers, if you're in the um, uh, hospitality industry, et cetera. Organized on the business entities that matter to you. And the data product uh, includes several key components. So obviously it needs to have an industry and use case specific schema, a fully trained machine learning model for doing entity resolution, data cleaning and enrichment capabilities, and rules for consolidating those records into those key entities. So that's what's necessary for the data product. And what does the data product sort of do? What does it deliver? You could think of this as JIRA for your data. So it's the mechanism under which the organization manages the delivery of data from a whole variety of sources to these key logical entities. And it empowers someone in your organization to be, well, hopefully more than one person, to be the data product owner. And the data product owner really think of it, it can be thought of as the product manager for the data. And so in similar, similar to what you might think about for a product manager, the data product owner thinks about establishing a vision for what this data is relevant for inside the organization, engages the business in understanding their requirements, maps those requirements into tasks the data engineering teams need to deliver, manages a backlog of work to deliver that, um, and helps to create this iterative cycle between the business challenge that's being trying to be addressed and the data that's being produced by that organization. And typically, and hopefully, data product owners are pretty hands-on, so they're actually spending time testing and evaluating that. So my last few seconds, uh, I, if this was interesting and you're interested in the other sort of 20 two, I guess, predictions that we have in the, uh, in the work and in the, in, the, in the report, uh, you can go to tamer.com slash predictions. You can see the URL right here. If you're super tech savvy, you can scan this QR code and it will magically take you there. And uh, if you download the, uh, the report now, uh, when you fill out the form, we're gonna send you one of these cool swig mugs. I can tell you from personal experience as a personal user of my swig mug. It is uh, super awesome. Uh, great coffee mug. It's exactly the right size for holding my coffee. Sometimes I find these mugs are like too big or too small. This is like perfect. Anyway, so scan the QR code, go to the URL. Uh, it's actually a very interesting report filled with uh, some fun and interesting predictions that you can agree with or disagree with as at your leisure. So Thanks for the time. I guess I hit stop share if that's right. I believe so. Let's see what happens. Hopefully I did that right. Anthony, thank you so much for this great kickoff and for the presentation. I hope you all get your free mud. That's amazing. I love it. Um, and uh, thanks to Tamer for sponsoring these webinars and helping to make these webinars happen. If you have any questions for Anthony, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section of your screen, as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar today. And let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. 
Thank you, Shannon. And uh, thank you, Anthony, for that uh, great introduction there and beginning. Uh, I will uh, also add my two cents and recommend that everybody go ahead and get that report from Tamer. It's a very good one. And I like how digestible each prediction is. And the mug's not too bad either. Okay, so today we're here to talk about 2023 trends in enterprise advanced analytics. And by now you have probably suffered through, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen um, prediction uh, articles or webinars or whatnot. I know I have, and uh, I've thrown most of them away and uh, I've added a few and uh, you're gonna get my perspective today. So I thank you very much. Here it is, January 12th. We like to wait until uh, you're back to work and you're already get, kind of getting back in the groove of things before we give you our predictions. So, so here we go. Hopefully uh, you're more paying attention because of the, because of the time. This is um, our technology stack. Just one brief minute on this. So if you're choosing any of these technologies, if you want to run a PLC on any of them, or if you're implementing one or more, uh, do let us know. We have expertise across the board, big and analytic data platforms, operational data, and all your data management tools. So we're talking about trends. Why are they important? Why should you care? Why should you care what everybody else uh, around you might be doing or where things are going? You want to see where that puck is headed. Uh, you want to uh, know where uh, budgets might be going towards over the next year. It's imperative to see these trends that affect your business and make a plan. Make a plan. Do you agree or not? And you need to pick your winners. Pick the things that you agree are going to be trends that make sense for your business and get on board with them. Because keep in mind that if you're picking a trend, it's very likely that the vendor community is going to be supporting that trend. It's going to be doing more with that trend. So what you see today is not where everything is going to go. For example, you're going to see quite a smattering of artificial intelligence based trends in my presentation. And that's because I am a huge believer that that is a real trend, a real trend setter. And uh, I want to make leaders out of the community here, not followers. And I want you to grow your business ideas as well. Maybe you can see in some of these trends some capabilities that you didn't know were very possible today. And maybe that can help shape the direction of your company's products and your company as a whole. So trends are important because of the efficiencies that you're going to gain and the capabilities that you're going to gain with them. Now, information management leaders, uh, you hear me talk about this a lot. Information management leaders of tomorrow can advance maturity while also solving business issues. And that is the big conundrum that you face as a leader is satisfying the short term and not, uh, not taking away too much from the long term while you do that. Unfortunately, many of our leaders uh, tend to focus only on the short term and leave behind a bit of a scorched earth when it comes to architecture, when it comes to tool selection, when it comes to overlap uh, within the organization, and so on. So try to stay out, of, stay out of that as much as you can while continuing to make your short-term gains. So I'm very well aware that uh, the ship must uh, keep sailing down the, the river here while you're picking, on, picking some of these trends to add. So uh, what I like to do is I like to look at the roadmap and think about the trends and see where can I start to bring those trends into my organization? Which product projects that are coming up can I influence to be part of a future trend so I can kill two birds with one stone? So let's look first at last year's trends. Now I am going to spend a few minutes on this slide. So uh, I do want to do this because I think it's important to know where we've come from, know what I was thinking, what we were all thinking really last year at this time, and uh, also see, well, how did we do? So the first three here, I've got edge AI and edge computing dominate architectures. Uh, I'll give myself maybe a, a B on this one because uh, I didn't specify industry. Industries that are completely dominated, uh, their architectures are dominated by edge computing, include things like industrial automation and manufacturing, transportation, logistics, energy and utilities, healthcare, telecom, public sector, and there's also a lot of smart city work going on. So those are definitely all, all about edge 
uh, but not everything is. Data scientists start doing more data science and data cultivation. Yes, I believe this is true now. Uh, data scientists used to be kind of glorified data integration architects, weren't they? Uh, but uh, they have been able to um, use more of their calling now, now that we are doing a better job, I think, generally across the board with our data architectures. Oh, yeah, they're still kind of messy, but uh, we've added a lot of things and gotten a lot more data under control, at least to the point where I think the trend from last year is true. Wide adoption of containerized data. This is data that's packaged and stored in a container format, such as a Docker container or Kubernetes pod, uh, maybe a B on this one as well, because while containerized applications are all the rage, not all of the data that we're using yet is in this containerized format, although I think that this is trending. As a matter of fact, if I look across the board at these trends from last year, I think I was probably just a little bit ahead of the game, right? A little bit ahead of myself, because a lot of these are going to be more true this year, maybe than last year. And you're going to see some more of these. I can, couldn't help it. You're going to see some more of these uh, come back up this year. And it's perfectly okay to have uh, a trend uh, over multiple years. Kubernetes. Yes, I just mentioned Kubernetes really taking off. Synthetic data used for training AI models. Yeah, you're going to be seeing this again. Um, I would say I get myself maybe somewhere between an A and a B on this because I think the synthetic data community, the vendor community that is for this stuff is really... Uh, blown up. And I think we're going to start seeing more uptake in this year. Data fabric sees uptake. Yes, the data fabric as an architectural, distributed architectural uh, adoption, adaptation, I should say, of uh, fundamental uh, architecture that is definitely seeing an uptake. Uh, but at the same time, I'm going to say that I think I think more enterprises, more people are claiming a data fabric than have actually lifted a finger to make it into what I guess the science of the data fabric says. So watch out for that. If, if we raised hands, I think we'd see a lot more raised hands around data fabric than what I suppose uh, an auditor might find. Moving right along, AI-enabled applications. Oh yeah, uh, our, the applications within our enterprises and the ones that we're developing are definitely AI enabled. You'll see some more of that today. Data catalogs cross chasm in the data stack. Yes, I think everybody at least thinks uh, about their data catalog. And um, I would say most organizations, at least that I come across, have a fairly well-developed, maybe not fully mature, but are really uh, putting effort into their, their data catalog and building it out to support all the artifacts that we have now around data. Data quality subsumed into data observ observability. Now, this is a trend that really I'm not saying data observability is taking off. I will say that this year, by the way, but I was saying that data quality is going to be subsumed into that. And yes, I believe that that did happen quite a bit. Street streaming analytics growth with IoT, yeah, kind of back to the edge architectures. Uh, definitely, if you're in IoT, you're doing that with streaming data. There's no other way. And so, yes, on that one. Sensors and automation drive data volume, kind of similar to the prior, prior bullet. Yes, uh, that did happen. Medicine jumps the shark on neurological disorders leading to a DNA revolution. Well, the wording might be a little bit out there. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but definitely this is a continued trend. DNA being, of course, that genetic material that carries the instructions for the development of us as living organisms. It's present in almost all cells in the body. It's made up of a long chain of genetic information. So in medicine, DNA is going to do things like diagnosis and treatment of gen genetic disorders, lead to personalized medicine, gene therapy, and forensics. So all of this. So that's coming. Finally, uh, artificial intelligence based on data moves hard into design. We're going to be using artificial intelligence to do more than uh, natural language processing and looking things up and it's a little bit of automation here and there. It's going to be designing, doing some of the uh, the real brain work uh, that we need it to, to do. Uh, not quite there yet. No, didn't, didn't win on that one, I don't think yet. I think we're going to see more of that this year. That design extends to tech and software. And yes, uh, I think the vendor community is definitely picking this up more so than the enterprise community. Auto ML cements itself as the future of ML. Not quite so sure on this one. I, I saw a lot of promise in auto ML. I still do. 
I still think that that's what's coming, but I still see a lot of enterprises not ready to say we trust it. We trust the algorithm selection of auto ML. We're going to go ahead and uh, pick our own algorithm. So we're developing a lot of expertise out there in the data science community about various algorithms. And that's a great thing. And so I suppose that that creates a, a better foundation to move into auto ML, maybe more this year. GPT-3 becomes the premier NLP. Well, I think I, okay, GPT-3, if I just said GPT-3 would be big, I would have hit it out of the park. Uh, if I, but I also believe that GPT-3 has become the premier NLP. There are competitors, uh, but oh my gosh, GPT-3, I mean, what, what can't be said? about what that's uh, what that's already done. If anything, I think um, some of the predictions that I've made for the year 2050 in ep the episode from, I think it was August of last year, go ahead, check it out on YouTube. Um, I think some of that, I might have to bring that date in because of uh, the power that we see in GPT-3 right now. Okay, let's get into the trends for this year. Data democratization. Okay, yeah, okay. that that's an easy one, right? <laughs> of course. Yes, everybody's going to realize that what we do in data and analytics is important. Uh, I, I do believe that that will happen. I think one of the important trends will be the continued empowerment of the entire workforce, rather than just data engineers and data scientists putting analytics to work within the enterprise. So this has given new rise to all forms of augmented working or tools, applications, and devices push intelligent insights into the hands of everybody to allow them to do their jobs more effectively and efficiently. And so I think uh, with, with my next trend, it's going to be about CDOs, uh, just a look ahead there, but it's it, it has to do with the importance of data within the organization and that the realization of the importance of that all the way to the executive level. We're going to see that in in 2023, if we have not seen it already, many organizations, I would say the leading organizations have already accepted this and are already doing a lot of things for uh, the, toward that end. Building a culture of data, building self-service analytics. In 2023, enabling the non-technical end user will become critical to the survival of that company, which leads us to the chief data officer. Now, uh, I'm going to put kind of my people-oriented trends up here at the beginning, and then we'll move to more architecture ones. Chief data officers will turn their focus to building a data culture. What I've seen up to date is CDOs kind of all over the place, if I'm being honest, in terms of what they do for an organization. And that's fine. They fit in where the organization has a, a gaping need. However, uh, there is some science behind the CDO role. There is some commonality of need across organizations. And that commonality of need in 2023 is going to be building that data culture, building a support culture for what I just talked about on the prior trend, the importance of data. So these challenges are going to remain of trying to get a focus around the CDO role. One of the biggest challenges we'll continue to be tackling, that, that they'll, they'll be tackling is trying to build and institute a data culture within the organization. And this will be addressed in 2023. I don't know that it will be fully solved. I do believe that they will turn their focus to it and that we'll make some headway. We'll improve data literacy. It's already an important part of the chief data officer's role, but 2023 will be the year when improving every employee's understanding of the importance of data becomes the top priority. Instituting a data culture at every level will help to overcome some of the foundational causes of other data challenges, while also ensuring that the data innov innovations of the past few years can be properly leveraged by business users. So there's a role for the CDO. The CDO role, by the way, will continue in force uh, across organization after organization. It'll be right up there. The, or the ongoing democratization of AI. Yeah, it's not just data. It's going to be democratized. It's going to be AI itself. If there isn't an app that does what you need, then it's increasingly simple to create your own, even if you don't know how to code, thanks to the growing number of no-code and low-code platforms. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But these are examples of this is like Sway AI, um, Accio, and oh my, the chat GPI APIs. Chat GPI APIs are going to be 
uh, really what builds the next generation of software vendors because that API is powerful. If you can take what ChatGPT does and you can focus on just a, a small slice of it and really build an app around that and put the proper UI on it, the customer experience and so on, there is a lot to be done around that. And I think that that will drive the next generation of, as I say, software vendors that are winners out there. Ultimately, the democratization of AI will enable businesses and organizations to overcome the challenges posed by the AI skills gap created by the shortage of workers that we're all well aware of. By empowering different people to become armchair data scientists and engineers, the power and utility of AI will become within reach for us all. By the way, on that point, I see no diminishing of the role of the data scientist in 2023, even though some more data science is going to be done by many more people. Okay, augmented working. And I hope you enjoy my doll E uh, artwork this month. It is, uh, the theme is Picasso. Okay, so in 2023, more of us are going, to, are going to find ourselves working alongside robots and smart machines. And uh, there's many examples of this already in place. AI-powered AI virtual assistants will be able, they'll be more prevalent and able to quickly answer questions as, and, and suggest alternative uh, methods in terms of what we're doing. And developing this ability to work with and alongside intelligent smart machines will become an increasingly indispensable work skill. So if you don't use the tools that are available to you, you will become increasingly dispensable. And so take a look at the possibilities around you for your organization, for the role that your department does, your organization does, and see how that, that can be supported by the technology that is possible today through AI and all the other things that we're talking about here. Make sure you're fully using the technology. Automation, uh, speaking of fully use, uh, utilizing the technology, automation is happening in our space of data. I, I'm, I'm sure we're all kind of well aware that machines can code and machines can build uh, quite complex code. Now we still need coders, not to worry about in 2023, but automation is happening around us for the some of the other things that we do too, like data quality. We see more processes becoming automated across the entire data management industry. And the primary reason for it is, of course, time savings. Resources and data engineers are scarce. Companies need out-of-the-box solutions that can automate some of their tasks. Right now, we see many processes getting automated with AI and metadata, data discovery and data source onboarding, data quality monitoring, data matching, and golden, golden record creation in master data management. So as we move into 2023, we can expect to see more companies switch to automated data and analytics, a system that uses advanced computer programs and simulations to discover and analyze digital information with, like it or not, little or no human intervention. So you wanna be behind this technology. To keep up with all these demands, IT will implement collaborative processes with stakeholders across many different departments. Some of the ones I can think about are finance, marketing, legal, research, HR. Data workflow automation is another big part of automation. So automating all of the handoffs that occur in any kind of workflow process to get something done within the organization. Saving time and money, and ensuring quality and ensuring consistency of the process. Data governance and regulation. So we all know about GDPR. Uh, I think the rest of the world will kind of pick up on this and have their own GP GDPRs in place. And there's not only, for example, GDPR in Europe, there's Canadian, what they call PIPEDA, and in China, the PIPL. Other countries are likely to follow suit. So these are our guardrails around going haywire with uh, the technology and doing quite anything and everything that we want. But most of the world's population will be covered by a GDP, GDPR type regulation uh, in 2023. So we need to move to ensure that we are in compliance with that. 
check our internal data processing and handling procedures, make sure they're adequately documented and understood. For many businesses, this will mean auditing exactly what information they have, how it is collected, where it is stored, and what is done with it. So looking back to my last year prediction about data catalogs, that's going to support this kind of work, for example. And the cloud providers themselves are delivering compliance systems now. We're shifting that burden now to the cloud provider to make sure that they are in compliance on our behalf for the data and the processes that we do with them. So this realization is particularly acute for the public cloud deployments, of course. They ensure every data is stored in a particular geography, for example, because of the distributed nature of cloud computing and the fact that it that doesn't have to be the case. Global cloud providers have the geograph geographic footprint to support this. We're also gonna be looking at the workflow capabilities of cloud environments and their regulatory compliance. So the cloud knows that I'm working on a specific project and that I'm supposed to perform my task after another person has performed it, et cetera, et cetera. It knows what needs to be done. And it's a matter of making sure that the tasks are done in the right way and they are reproducible. So that's my data governance and regulation trend. Real-time data, if you're not doing it already, you'll be doing it most likely in 2023. When you dig into data in search of insights, as we do in analytics, right? It's better to know what's going on now rather than yesterday. I know that's kind of a, a broad statement, kind of an obvious statement, but then we have to break that down. How is it better? Well, you'll hear me say many times, and I speak to architects a lot, you shouldn't be waiting for the business users to say, this is what we need. We need to be bringing them the possibilities. And if they're not asking for real-time data, that's not the reason to not be delivering more real-time data. You need to grow within the user community the need, the ability to deal with real-time data because that is the way that the world is going. That is the way that our data needs to go. Real-time data is increasingly becoming the most valuable source of information for the business. And working with this data often requires more sophisticated data and analytics infrastructure, which may mean more expense. Nobody likes that, but the benefit is that we're able to act on the information as it happens. This could be clickstream data. This could be monitoring transactions as they take place to make sure that we're not getting into a fraud type situation. The data fabric, here it is again, because I think it's gonna be a strong trend. This is, eh, I like to say it's a data virtualization on steroids. This data management connects all data sources and data management components through the metadata. And once you connect it in a frictionless, as a frictionless asset, providing access to an enterprise data to all relevant stakeholders, you have a data fabric. When fully integrated, this can create a user-friendly and predominantly autonomous enterprise-wide data coverage interface. And by the way, I'm not saying this to the exclusion of the data mesh. These are analogous concepts and definitely they can work together. The mesh is more distributed, whereas the fabric is something that overlays data wherever it is. They both can work together. So I do believe the mesh is a strong trend as well. I also think we're going to be taking more advantage of the multi-model capabilities within databases. More, than, more, more databases than not have multi-model capabilities. So maybe we're going to start to see a trend towards utilizing fewer databases than more databases. And this will be the reason, multi-model. So for example, you can use a key value store for a shopping cart and session data a document or maybe a column store for consuming the completed orders, a relational database for the inventory and the financials, and a graph store for customer relationships for marketing. Or you could use maybe one database that does all of these to at least a sufficient degree for the needs of the application. Typically, we find multi-model databases in the uh, NoSQL uh, arena. And some of the leading ones are going to be MongoDB, Couchbase, OrientDB, OrangoDB, MarkLogic, Neo4j, Redis, and Amazon DocumentDB. So we're going to be using those databases for its mul their multi-model capabilities. Data observability. 
I talked last year about this uh, data data quality becoming subsumed into observability. Uh, and observability, now I'm going to say, is going to take off. Data quality is constantly evolving, and quality initiatives begin with a rule-based approach. Later organizations will grow their use of data and start working on rule-less solutions that re rely more on AI and ML to find that low-quality data, and that's a trend. But this trend of, towards observability is it looks at data quality issue detection and resolution holistically and employs various techniques to monitor data health. That's data observability, if I can say it. <laughs> it's your organization's ability to understand the state of your data based on the information that you're collecting. Uh, there's a bunch of tools out there that, uh, that claim obser observability. Check them out. Coming to a shop near you. Next, cloud-native technologies and containerized applications. Yeah, this is a bit of an extension from last year's predictions. Well, we're still here. We're still doing it. It's still a trend. It still was a trend last year, continues to be a strong trend this year as I look around. Cloud-native data management technologies present several advantages. And because of this, cloud adoption is accelerating in all industries. Cloud databases account for most database revenue growth, for example. Interest and success in the cloud come down to the benefits of scalability, low upfront costs, easier to use, the good customer experience, and consumption-based pricing. Occasionally, we like that, where you only pay for what you use. Another growing trend is using containerized applications, and I throw them together because they work together, right? Containerized applications allow you to deploy using Docker, or Kubernetes, an app on any hardware without needing to change the code base. And it's tiny bits of code com compared to full applications. And I think containerized applications are the way to go and the way that I see most applications being built in 2023. Right now, I would say it's probably on the order of a little bit less than half. But I think as time goes on, uh, this is sticking, and we're going to see more containerized applications. So if you work on the data side, the analytics side of things, uh, get to know your containerized applications and how you can most effectively support that type of application. Because I expect the number of organizations that have containerized apps to be a majority and for that majority to be doing a majority of their applications as containerized. Now, low code and no code. By making the apps more straightforward, requiring less coding, you can take you can make data management processes available to more users and roles. And there are various low-code, no-code data apps. The list is long, but Microsoft has its Power Apps. There's Airtable, Notion, different things like that. These are examples of low-code, no-code apps that almost any user can learn to use. Uh, there's there's some there's others that I think have really embraced this low-code, no-code in our space. Atacama data observability is one. Another one is one data. One data provides an easy way for business users to onboard data, improve data collaborative, collaboratively, check its quality in an automated way, and provide that data to other applications or users. So pretty cool uh, to think about doing stuff like that without coding. Organizations are also creating localized apps of their own with simple workflows. Localized apps can lead to localized databases that can manage minor local problems. What else is a strong trend? Yeah, there's so many. There's so many trends going on right now. We, we are definitely at the precipice of change. Serverless computing. By abstracting away the underlying infrastructure, serverless computing allows users to focus on the development of the application it makes it easier. There's that theme again. You get your cost savings, you get scalability, flexibility, improved reliability, increased speed of development and deployment, and it's event-driven. Serverless computing compute is built around event triggers. It allows you to build highly responsive and efficient systems that can respond to changes in real time. So can you see the power of all these together means that you become a much more efficient organization? Absolutely. The leadership of technology within these large and mid-sized organizations needs to be driving this kind of change within the organization this year in order for that company 
company to be successful. Comprehensive data protection well beyond the database uh, grants and revokes <laughs> that we used to do. Given the reliance on, the, on virtual tools to support hybrid work environments across the globe, increasing adoption of software as a service, and the continued growth of enterprise data, it's inevitable that cybersecurity threats will persist and become increasingly complex in 2023. It's nearly impossible to prevent all the ways that bad actors can infiltrate. Organizations must deploy security strategies that include not just prevention and detection, but data protection, backup, and recovery as well. So I expect to see more IT and security decision makers adopting cloud-based backup, for example, and as security threats remain persistent, cloud data management and protection features like cross-region replication and object lock immutability will be increasingly important tools for security and infrastructure. And there's a whole host of tools that you'll want to add to your stack, including those that do attribute-based access control. So there's different types of access control. And this is probably the slide that gets, gets a little bit into the weeds more than the others. Um, but I, I felt like it was a really strong trend. And that's attribute-based access control, as opposed to the alternative uh, policy-based access control and role-based access control. So all of the above, yes, if you do them well, you're good, but some are going to require more work on your part than others. And let's face it, work equals doesn't get done. And when it doesn't get done in security, that means vulnerability. So I think there's an approach here within those three uh, possibilities that works, uh, in my view, a little bit better than the others, and that's the attribute-based access, access, access control, which probably should be selected before you get into selecting your access control tool, and that is the uh, methodology by which that tool uh, goes about doing its access control is probably more important than the tool itself. Neural network, machine learning model for text. GPT-3, I'm back to that. I'm back to that. It's a massive neural network that has the capability of 175 billion machine learning parameters. Sounds like a lot, sounds, sounds important. Well, surely you know by now uh, a little bit about what, that is, what that's all about. It was trained on hundreds of billions of words, cookbooks, Wikipedia, and the general web, books in general, and coding. And the training data is all encompassing. It's, a, it's been a matter of time since all of this data, which is in one internet, is harvested and used for more purposes than I'm going to look up something here and there. And that's today. That is absolutely today. GPT-3 calculates, for example, how likely one word is to appear in a text, given the other words in the text. And boy, does it have a lot of examples at its disposal. And this is what's known as the conditional probability of words. It allows it to quote unquote write for us. And I, I fear that writing, I fear that art, I fear that music, and I love music. I fear that all these things are going the way of AI. And uh, remains to be seen what that all means for us as people enjoying these sorts of things. The public can still use GPT-3, even though Microsoft has an exclusive license. Of course, it's all of the, all of the news right now that Microsoft is about to make an investment in GPT-3 that will value the company OpenAI at $29 billion. And uh, stay tuned on that. Synthetic data used for training AI models. So this gets a little bit into Anthony's uh, prediction uh, earlier about data products. Uh, how do we build those data products? Synthetic data will be a requirement to build the enterprise. The enterprise cannot be built without the use of synthetic data. It's gonna become an important part of the stack. I don't see it on a lot of stack diagrams yet, but I feel like it needs to be there because if you're creating AI that you need to identify the mundane things like, I don't know, cars and buildings and trees and so forth, you don't want to, you don't have the data for that. But, but that doesn't mean that you can't have that capability. If you wanna be able to understand different languages, if you want to be able to 
uh, understand the weather, et cetera. Just about anything that is not in your core competency, you have access to that data and can train your AI on that data by going to the synthetic data marketplace. I work with one of these synthetic data uh, companies and it's just fascinating. They, this company has had people all over the world, thousands of people uh, go ahead and read some general text of about 10 to 20 minutes that a customer service uh, professional would, would say. Like, thank you very much for calling. Um, <laughs> what are you calling about today? All this sort of thing. And it's, it's able to create the voice or you're able to create the voice with this by training it with this kind of data and, and uh, make your apps say the things that you want them to say. I hope I said that right. But synthetic data is very important. Finally, last prediction, and then we'll get to some Q and A. And by the way, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q and A panel for Anthony and I, we'll get there in just a few minutes. AI infusion. AI will continue to be prominent in traditional BI and analytics solutions. Heck, if Microsoft is thinking about adding ChatGPT to Word, isn't it logical that we're going to see AI infusion into the analytics uh, that, we, uh, that we deploy as well? AI will continue to be prominent in traditional BI and analytics solutions. In particular, self-service tools uh, will directly integrate advanced analytics functionality from por AI portfolios to make it easier for users to identify, provision, prepare, and understand data. So a lot of things are going to get easier, which might mean some other things are going to get harder in 2023. The complexity is not abating at all in terms of what we do, in terms of what we, what we have to be. Uh, to be the best in 2023. But I hope that you feel that you are up to the challenge of 2023 and you are going to get yourself the education that's required. You're going to have uh, a true north that you're guiding not only your enterprise, but yourself towards in 2023. And you're going to find ways to bring some of this into your organization, into your world and uh, enjoy it. So finally, I'll say embedded analytics, building on the general trend towards data as an API service, companies will see more opportunities to embed analytical charts within line of business processes. Many of these will be pre-built and supported by use case specific AI outcomes. Now, there's more maturity moving imperfectly than in merely perfectly defining the shortcomings. A lot of us could sit back and say, well, that's wrong. That's not that's not uh, doing something that's scalable to the future, but we need to step in and be able to say, here's the better way. And we need to do that the right way within organizations, especially today as so many of us are working from home. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't talk yourself out of having a new beginning. It's okay. It's okay. I've reinvented myself many times and uh, it's time this year for you to reinvent yourself. This is your year. Have an open mind. No plateaus are comfortable for long. So whatever plateau you are on, your enterprise is on, uh, maybe it's comfortable now, but it will not be comfortable for long. And so we want to be part of, we, we don't want the discomfort to hit us. Like AI is going to hit so many people like a ton of bricks. They're not going to know what hit them. They have no idea of what AI can do for them. They think it's uh, C3PO, <laughs> you know? Um, it's not that at all, as most of us now know and are learning more about. So the resistance that you get to your change making, it's not necessarily about making progress, but it's the journey. You want to be the one to carry them on that journey. So in summary, prepare to securely build or bring on more users of data. Yes. Look for automation possibilities. Implement a data fabric over your data infrastructure cloud native technologies and containerized applications all the way. Think low code, no code first. It's not going to solve everything. It's not going to be a solution out there in low code, no code for everything, but definitely check it out before you plunge ahead. Look at your data security options. Pick the right one for you. Add to what you're doing now in terms of data security. Think machine learning for text analysis and really for everything infusing AI into all of your applications in 2023. That brings me to the end of 
my part and I'll turn it back to Shannon for the Q&A. William and Anthony, thank you so much for these great presentations and for kicking off the year with some trends and things to look forward to. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by the end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested. So diving in here, um, so what about data literacy? Is it an important trend for 2023? Um, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Anthony. Go ahead. I would say uh, data literacy is absolutely something we've seen, but in, as a as a kind of new trend for 2023, I think data literacy is something that we've been talking about uh, for some time. Um, I think that's certainly why it doesn't appear on on our list. Um, but what do you think? I think it'll be a, a bit of a knock on to the trend that I said earlier about CDOs are going to turn their focus to building a data culture. They're not going to be able to do that without more data literacy uh, in enterprises. Um, so I, I think we'll struggle with that. So, and I, I think that not everybody's going to come around to that that understanding in 2023. So it didn't make my list, but I think it it needs to be a part of what the CDO is driving in organizations. Perfect. So, what's the difference between data mesh and data fabric? Okay. Um, I think I'll probably have a whole webinar devoted to this topic uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> By the way, we give these on the second Thursday of every month. So I forget which month it is that I'll be talking more about this, but the data, uh, I think I talked about the data fabric in here. I talked about both of them, but the, the fabric is more of the metadata overlay on whatever data that you have, enabling all of that data to be utilized together. Uh, in, in in queries, in applications, and so on, creating uh, an asset uh, that comprises uh, a lot of the organization's data, which is great. Uh, a mesh is is the notion of of departmentalizing the application the, 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 the data architecture. So not one data warehouse and data lake and and path to uh, pipeline that is to a machine learning environment, but many within the organization, but not completely independent. While there should be some sharing of resources, maybe there could be an enterprise data warehouse that comprises some of the data that the organization needs and so on. But it's a way of dividing and conquering this whole messy notion of having a data architecture within an organization by having parts of data, the data architecture everywhere, but making them work uh, together holistically. So the only thing I would add to that very briefly is that in the context of uh, a data mesh with an overlay of the metadata in the fabric, uh, one of the really important concepts that you need to think about is entity resolution and thinking about finding common data elements across that fabric, or sorry, across the mesh or within the mesh, what is that language? Um, you know, this is something that Tamer spends a lot of time thinking about, that, and that's really the core IP behind the machine learning we built, which is how to find those entities within that. Perfect. And we've just got a couple minutes left, but I'm going to throw a question in here if we, uh, for that elevator pitch answer. I see an earlier comment on biases in AI, as most of what is called now, what is called AI now is information automation at scale, uh, not intelligence biases will be amplified by the products that are not fully explainable. It chills my spine to hear a trend of slapping a UI and consolidated statistical natural language processing and vision models. I know it's happening. I'm in our presenter on your take on that. Um, okay. So, yeah, why, why oh, you go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> okay, a lot of words there. So I hope I'm answering your question, but... Um, you know, yeah, by, of bias, of course, uh, there's uh, there's bias in, in the data. There are different ways to uh, support that. Um, I, I don't quite know if the question was about, uh, is that going to be a problem in 2023? Um, is that going to be rectified? Is that, uh, does that bias, I guess, where the architecture goes for artificial intelligence in 2023? Uh, so I'll just say about bias that, um, that I, I think we're doing, a, we're, we're, we're at least in 2023, we're going to become much more aware 
of the problems of uh, bias and probably we're going to feel it. We're going to have some failures as a result of the bias uh, within our data and we're going to have to do a better job at data. I'll say it again, data is uh, absolutely uh, number one importance to making artificial intelligence work. So if that's uh, not supporting the not supporting you, then you're, not, you're just not going to have success. And bias is a huge part of whether that's true or not. So I think the, the, the point about model explainability is also really interesting. And I suspect that a trend for 2024 will be the rise of model explainability. Um, and I say that because if I ask uh, anyone on this call a question and then have you explain to me why it is you gave me the answer you gave, the explanation is likely to have as much bias as the answer. And similarly, asking a model, uh, any AI model, uh, trained on a large volume of data is, you know, the the challenge of trying to make something explainable is is arguably harder than having it give you the answer in the first place. And you can, by the way, you can test this by going to Chat GPT and asking it why it gave the answer it gave. Uh, it does an atrocious job of answering that question, <laughs> as you would expect. So, so I, I think it's a it's an extremely important problem that that you know we're you're only beginning to touch the surface of solving. Well, again, thank you both so much for this great presentation and time, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have scheduled for this webinar. Again, just a reminder to all registrants, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to slides and links to the recording. Thanks to all our attendees who have been is so engaged in everything that we do. Thanks to Tamer for sponsoring today and helping to make these webinars happen. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, William. Thanks, Anthony. Our Thank pleasure. you. Bye-bye.